Anna. Okay, uh, thank you. So, so I will uh, start again where uh, I left, where I was uh, starting to describe uh, uh, how in the very specific Coulomb case, you can use Poisson's equation to rewrite uh, the double integral, which is the energy as a single integral. And we're going to use this in order to prove now uh, a weak, strong uniqueness just for solution at the level of solutions. for solutions of the limiting equation. So dt rho plus divergence in the Coulomb case. So k would be either minus square g or some anti-symmetric uh, operator times square g or anything that's um, basically creating um, dissipation. So uh, I, I say the definition M grad G with M negative. Okay, and G here is Coulomb. All right, so in order to describe the proof, I'm going to introduce a, a new object which is called the stress energy tensor. Oh, I mean, it's not new, uh, it, it's, not, it's just new uh, in this course, but it's not new. Stress energy tensor. So that's a, an object that's quite uh, common in fluid mechanics or in mechanics in general. So every time you have a, uh, an energy which comes from a Lagrangian uh, and every time you have a conservation law, you, you have a stress tensor. So this is a, well, you have a stress tensor uh, conservation law. But, uh, so you can always define this thing. And here in this particular case, it takes this form. So I'm gonna denote it like this. And so I, I continue using this notation, you see H superscript mu for G convolved mu. Here, H mu is G coval with mu. And the tensor denoted with these brackets, so with indices i and j, is going to be 2 dih djh minus grad h squared delta ij. This is the Kronecker symbol. So it's uh, 1 if i equals j and 0 otherwise. Okay, so you can see right away that point-wise, this thing is is uh, is bounded by uh, an order of grad h squared. So it's like um, it's going to be, for example, integrable. Uh, and the important relation is this algebra that uh, divergence of this tensor in the sense of uh, Okay, so this is a this is like a matrix, right? So you can take either the divergence of the rows or the divergence of the columns, but because it's it's symmetric, uh, it's the same. You take the divergence of the rows or the divergence of the columns, and that creates a vector, right? For each row, you take the divergence, you get a number. This way, you make a vector. So this is uh, this is in fact, uh, if you want, keeps one in the index. So it's the sum over j from one to n of dj grad h mu ij. So that's the definition. Yeah. And if you compute, so it's a direct computation, you find two grad h mu, so two, two d i h mu, Laplacian h mu, so that means, in other words, I can write that div grad h mu is a, as a vector is two grad h mu Laplacian h mu. Now the Laplacian of h, you remember, because it's the Coulomb case, it's just like mu up to a factor, so minus two over c d mu grad h mu. Okay, so 
you see here you have a product between this thing, which in principle is a measure, and this thing, which doesn't necessarily have that much regularity. So this is all valid if mu is regular enough. Uh, and if mu was not that regular, then, then this, uh, this uses the chain rule and it's not valid. But now it, it can be used to give a weak meaning to this product. Right, so otherwise, because it's a divergence of something which is well defined. And, and so this is used in fluid mechanics quite a bit, uh, this, this, no, uh, this possibility. Okay, so now we, we, we store this for a minute and, and now we're gonna make a, a little computation, which is that we're gonna assume now that we have two solutions. U1, mu 2 and H1 and H2 are H mu i. And I'm going to differentiate in time what was the Coulomb distance, you remember? So between mu 1 and mu 2. So let's, uh, let's recall what it was. So it's dt of the double integral of g of x minus y t mu minus mu one minus mu two mu one minus mu two okay but now i can actually uh, rephrase this double integral as a single integral like i was doing here okay so if i do that this becomes dt integral gradient h1 minus h2 square. And now it becomes easy to differentiate. So let's, let's differentiate. So what you're gonna find is two integral gradient. All right, okay, so we can do it in uh, two steps. Gradient h1 minus h2 dot gradient dt h1 minus dt h2. Uh, and maybe it's easier to integrate by parts right away. So by Green's formula, and I told you last time I can justify that there is no boundary terms at infinity. So this is all over rd. rd, this is going to become minus two integral of h1 minus h2 dt. Laplacian H1 minus Laplacian H2. And this is very good because now uh, the Laplacian of H is it's mu up to some constants. Okay, so this is one of the CD. Uh, sorry, C2 CD. Integral of H1 minus H2 dt mu1 minus mu2. And now we can input the uh, equation satisfied by mu, which is the discontinuity equation here. Okay, so mu, I told you sometimes I call it mu, sometimes I call it rho, but so it's the same. So now this thing by the equation, that's equal to minus divergence of, uh, so minus grad g, so let's write plus divergence of grad g convolved with mu one, mu one minus grad g convolved with mu two, mu two. Okay, but grad g convolved with mu one, that's also the same as grad h. So I can rewrite this as two cd, h one minus h two, divergence of grad h one, that's exactly the definition of H, G convolved with mu one. 
So grad H1 mu1 minus grad H2 mu2. And then one other call for integration by parts, right? We sort of want to do this. Apply Green's formula again. And you get grad H1 minus H2 dotted with grad H1 mu1 minus grad H2 mu2. So here you recognize these products, right? Grad H times mu, grad H times mu. Um, and we're gonna regroup the terms a little bit differently. So I want to make uh, something appear, which is H1 minus H2. So on the on this second term uh, in the right, I'm going to um, I'm gonna do as if mu one was always in factor. So I'm gonna do grad H one minus grad H two mu one, right? Which is uh, uh, making a mistake because this is grad H two mu two, and then I correct the mistake by adding grad H two mu one minus mu two. So here I've done the dissipative case. Huh? So I've assumed that uh, the equation here, this is the dissipative gradient flow case. What you can do is you can check that if it's not the gradient flow, if it's the other types of flow, conservative or what, it's just gonna add some operator in front here. So we're gonna have an M. And, 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 and it's not really going to change the proof. So it works as well. Okay, so I, I, I don't write it, but it's really, the proof works just as well. Uh, and now we have uh, something with a sign, minus two CD integral of rad H1 minus H2 squared D mu one. So this thing has a sign. As I said, if you have this operator M, it would have a, there would be an M in, inside the scalar product, but that would still have a sign. That's the assumption on M. Uh, so that's the, if you want, that's a dissipative term. And uh, in the conservative case, it's just not present. And then we get another term, which is minus two CD integral of rad H2 dotted with, so what do I have? I can put here grad H1 minus H2 times mu1 minus mu2. So if you, if maybe this is a bit ambiguous, I can put this one after. Okay, so now here, what we do is we recognize that something of this form, mu grad h mu. See, for, for the difference of measures, mu one minus mu two, this is exactly of this form, mu grad h mu. And so we can rewrite this in the form of the divergence of a, a stress tensor. So I'm gonna rewrite this as, uh, so divergence, this whole thing, recognized as the divergence of stress tensor associated with mu one minus mu two, so grad H one minus H two. And there are some constants that are going to be floating. Uh, so CD minus CD over two, minus CD over two. And so finally, I can rewrite this whole thing as being less or equal than uh, integral of grad H2 dotted with divergence grad H1 minus H2. And now one last thing, integrate by parts again. And I will bound this by C times integral of two derivatives of H2 times just uh, the modulus or the norm of grad H1 minus H2, this tensor. 
And to conclude, what do we say? Well, we, we, are, we are proving a weak, strong uniqueness principle. So we are allowed to assume that one of the solutions is regular. So I'm going to assume that this second solution is regular. And that will allow me to assume that D2H2 is in L infinity. So remember that's D2 of the potential generated by U2. So now I bound this by C, L infinity norm of D2H2. So it's L infinity uniformly in space time. So something like this. So I bound by this and then the modulus of the stress tensor, go back to the definition of the stress tensor here. And I remember that this is bounded pointwise by uh, just the quadratic, uh, you know, by the square of the gradient. So this I can bound pointwise by gradient H1 minus H2 up to a constant square. <coughs> And so what have we obtained? So this finishes uh, an inequality which started here, which was differentiating this quantity and which bounded it by basically itself. So we have obtained dt integral of that h1 minus h2 squared is less than c. Uh, a constant that depends on this norm of H2 times the same quantity. Okay. So by Grandval, by Grandval's lemma, the integral, which now, you know, seen as a function of time. T that's less than exponential C. And of course, the C depends on mu2 huh? times T times the initial value. There you go. <coughs> okay, so this proves uniqueness because if the two solutions are initially the same, this will be zero. Then this will be zero. And so H1 will have to be equal to H2. And because mu1 is Laplacian H1, mu2 is Laplacian H2 up to constants, they will also have to be equal. Uh, and so that's uniqueness, but it's better than uniqueness, it's stability really. It's weak, strong stability because as soon as mu2 is a regular enough solution, in the sense that this is uh, bounded, you have stability near the solution. And so you can hope to uh, apply the same idea with the empirical measures, which satisfy a similar equation. Okay, so. This is, the, uh, this is the simplest proof. And you can see that it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very, um, it seems very rigid in the sense that it really is using the Coulomb nature of the interaction in a, in a crucial way via these, uh, these potentials, H mu and the Poisson equation that they solve. Uh, and it goes through the stress tensor that allows to rewrite uh, the terms that are here, etc. Okay, so we will see a slightly different point of view on this computation a little bit later. But this was the starting point, and, and this is the idea that's borrowed from, uh, yeah, as I said, the, the work I, I first did on the uh, convergence of uh, vortex equations in uh, condensed matter physics. Uh, so now the difficulty, of course, is going to make this work with this, uh, with the true solutions, which are discrete and which have Dirac's, and for which we're going to use this, uh, this uh, Coulomb distance in, in some sense instead. 
So because of this removal of the diagonal, it's not going to be so clear how to make the computation work, but I will show you in a minute. So before that, let me start by stating a, a theorem. So theorem. So how do I write this? So assume the limiting equation, it's zero plus divergence of M grad G on four with rho times rho equals zero. And we're gonna give it some initial data. <coughs> assume this equation has a solution rho T which belongs uh, to, which is at L infinity, the zero T infinity of RD. So assume there exists some interval of time, zero T where you have a nice solution. And we're gonna look at all these risk cases between T minus two, the Coulomb case and D. We assume this and that. So when S is strictly less than T minus one, that's all that we need to assume. And uh, when S is bigger than T minus one, you need to assume a little more regularity. So some, some holder regularity. Or some appropriate exponent. So that's not all because that's the boundedness of the solution. And you also assume this thing that I said, you have two derivatives of the potential, right? So this potential H rho T, which is G convolved with rho T has two derivatives that are bounded in the interval. Then this quantity F, uh, the modulated energy that I defined before, you can bound it uh, in the same way by some exponential times a constant depending on these norms of rows. So the various norms of rho T that, that are controlled here times T times the initial one plus possibly uh, some small error. And the error is some negative power of N. So it is, it's, it's quantitative and this beta, I'm oh, sorry, beta, it's not the temperature. Huh? So there's no temperature. So we will give it a different name, call it alpha. So alpha can be made explicit, but I prefer not to. It's a positive number. And so uh, that shows that if the modulated energy is initially small, if it's initially small, then it remains small for uh, any time interval. Uh, and then what you want to deduce from that is the convergence of the empirical measures. And it is true because Fn is a good metric, but I will justify it later. Uh, in particular, this implies that if uh, the empirical measure, the initial one, mu and zero converges in the weak sense of measures to rho zero, and if there is no initial excess of energy, so if this thing is small initially, so I, you can consider this as a well-prepared assumption. Right, not too much energy, then for every time between zero and capital T, the empirical measure does converge to the expected uh, road. Okay, so I see there's a question.
All right, so that's the uh, first statement of this theorem. In this version, uh, which is a combination of the works of Durang and myself. <coughs> Uh, and it, it raises some natural questions now. It, it says that you will have convergence provided you know that you have a smooth enough solution in the limit. Right? So it's a conditional result. Uh, and so uh, let, let me put many remarks now. Okay, so it boils down to a question of well preparedness and of a sort of uh, propagation of regularity. Uh, for this uh, limiting equation. We call it the mean field equation. Okay, so it boils down it reduces to knowing that Uh, solutions to mean field equation first that they exist, but they better exist, and are sufficiently regular uh, for regular initial data. So let's say you start with an initial data, which is, uh, you see, you assume here always L infinity. So let's assume rho naught is in L infinity, for instance or in C sigma, is it true that it will remain uh, at infinity and that you will have these types of bounds? And for how long is it true? Because you know the interval of time on which the theorem holds is the interval of time of, of validity of a regularity statement. Okay, so now you have a PD equation. So it's a PD equation. And do we have answers to this? Well, we have some partial answers. And so when we are in the gradient flow case, uh, this PD is so the mean field equation is called the fractional porous medium equation. Well, at least in some circles, it's called the fractional force medium equation. And people have studied it uh, for that reason. Um, so there is some results for S less than D minus one. That say that basically, yes, you do propagate regularity and you do it for all time. Uh, so there is some, some result by uh, Chiao, Zhu, and Caffarelli Vasquez. Vasquez is a person who has studied these equations quite a lot. Caffarelli, Soria, and Vasquez. Uh, when S is D minus two, which is the Coulomb case, then the mean field equation in the gradient flow case, huh? so then the mean field equation has been studied uh, for its own right. And it has a, people have exploited the fact that it has a nice structure, uh, which is a gradient, Wasserstein gradient flow. The two vessels time. Of course, of the energy uh, that you guess, huh? so the, this is the energy. So a Wasserstein gradient flow in the sense. Uh, you know, of Otto, Ambrosio, Gili, Savare, if you've ever heard of these, uh, these notions. 
And so this was exploited by uh, Ambrosio and myself. Uh, so, so, so many, many papers on this uh, equation, not all using the gradient flow structure, but uh, the first one by, was by Lin and Zhang. Um, on this here, and there's this paper by Ambrosio and myself, which exploits the gradient flow structure. And there is uh, some later paper by Vasquez and myself. Uh, there is also some smoothies on the paper. So. In any case, the bottom line is when S is D minus two, uh, it's okay. And there's also a paper by Durang, which showed that you have T equals infinity, basically. You can go to, to infinite time for all these uh, dissipative equations. The conservative cases have been less studied except for the point vortex system, which uh, is Euler, the incompressible Euler equation, which of course is very well studied. So it, it seems that our, our uh, let's say our, our roadblock in terms of our understanding is really this D minus one threshold. Okay, so at the end of this, the conclusion is everything that you need is kind of known for S less than D minus one, but S bigger than D minus one is apparently uh, quite open. So it could be that the theorem is empty um, when S is bigger than D minus. Okay, so another comment I want to make is that uh, we assume that, uh, that the solutions are bounded, so not necessarily continuous, uh, and that has two derivatives of the potential bounded. So this is actually not too bad. Okay, so assumptions, the assumptions here. D2 over rho t and infinity. They allow for uh, patch solutions. So what I mean by patch solutions, there are, for example, indicator function of a set. Right, so indicator function of some set which varies in time. Uh, and in um, Euler's equation, in the incompressible uh, Euler equation that you encounter here, these are actually important solutions. So, you know, you have these vortex patch solutions and they're going to move. So they are discontinuous. You see the, the distribution rho t is just L infinity and it just satisfies this. Not more. So, example uh, vortex patch solutions of Euler. which were studied by uh, Serfati, a uh, guy with almost the same name as me, but with an I at the end. Uh, so, it's not me, and Chemin, uh, some uh, two, 30 years ago. Uh, and why do we care to include these uh, patch solutions? Well, because in the Coulomb case, patch solutions are actually attractors of the dynamics. This is something that we showed with Vasquez. Uh, so what I mean by this is if you start with a, 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 a typical solution, you know, I don't know, some, some sort of blob of mass, and you run this gradient flow, uh, so it corresponds to a Coulomb repulsion, right? So you have a cloud of points and they, they repel themselves with Coulomb interaction. So what, what is the cloud going to do? It's just going to spread. Right? So you imagine you start with your blob and the thing just spreads. So it spreads and eventually it fills the whole plane and mass is conserved. Right? These equations here, they, you can look and uh, they conserve mass. Yeah. 
So in fact, uh, the, the, there is a self-similar solution, which is just an expanding characteristic function. An expanding indicator function, right? So it's something like this. And now you imagine it's spreading like that. So, so imagine it's a ball and it spreads. And so of course the, the height goes down. So as it spreads, the, uh, an infinity norm goes to zero. Yeah. So rho t at infinity goes to zero, as t goes to infinity. So these self-similar solutions, they are attractors of the dynamics and they are patch solutions. So you, you want them to be included in the, in the theory, it's more satisfactory. And so for the non-Coulomb case, so for S different than G minus two, more generally, you also have uh, attractors of the dynamics, which are self-similar solutions that are called Baron-Blatt solutions in the, in the community of this fractional porous medium. So self-similar, and I can give you the formula for them. They are going to look like this. So they're like an inverted parabola, but truncated. So S minus D plus two over two plus. Okay, so what does this thing look like? It looks like this, just some sort of inverted power thing, but then truncated and which is expanding. So again, remember repulsion. Um, so when S is equal to D minus two, you see this becomes just a power zero. And so this is how this degenerates to a, to a discontinuous uh, solution. So I, in fact, you can extend this formula for S equal D minus two and recover this solution. So this is also in uh, Vasquez, uh, Vasquez and myself, but it was these solutions, they, they were first uh, introduced in other papers. Um, of Vasquez, uh, Ampere, Karch, I think, and others. Okay, so this is, uh, this, this is I think, uh, for the, this comment. Now, another comment is that uh, these pretty stringent assumptions that uh, rho has to be bounded and you have to have this, have been relaxed since then by uh, Matt Rosenzweig. I will write here. Rosenzweig in some more recent papers show that it suffices to assume to assume uh, rho zero in L infinity. Um, so what what he showed is if you assume rho zero in L infinity, then you have uniform in time uh, propagation of uh, regularity and result in the 2D log case. So it's a very particular case, right? It's a Coulomb 2D, the case of vortex, uh, point vortex system or either dissipative or conservative uh, or uh, local in time in other Coulomb cases. Other dimension. Okay, so he is, I think he showed that if you start with something bounded, then for a short time at least, uh, you, you remain regular enough to, to apply the theorem. So to, to have the same theorem, so you don't have to worry now about che checking this, for instance. You don't have to worry about checking. Well, he's in the Coulomb case. So. Uh, so this is a nice, uh, a nice improvement. Um, 
and it relies on uh, exploiting uh, better the proof that I will show you. Um, another thing I can say is he in, included uh, models where you have multiplicative noise. So it's not uh, it's not the models I was talking with diffusion, but it's a, it's a multiplicative noise that's added. And finally, um, another remark I want to make is, uh, and I don't know if I'll have time to come back to this, it's the fact that uh, in the dissipative case, you see the solutions are essentially expanding out uh, and converging to zero in long time. So this is this. Uh, and on the other hand, this theorem, if you look at the result, Something not very satisfactory is the fact that the constant here degenerates in large time, right? It's exponentially large. So, uh, of course, if you are interested in very large time in convergence to minimizers, well, this thing is telling you less and less. So, it turns out that you can exploit the decay uh, of rho t as time gets large to get something that's a global in time estimate. So, I will mention this uh, with Matt Rosenzweig. Exploit the decay in time. So you need to have a quantitative decay. And that's, of course, in the dissipative case, because otherwise you don't have decay in time. So as soon as you have dissipation of dissipative case, to obtain a global in time uh, convergence. So actually, we do it mostly when we have uh, when we also have noise because the, the noise ha helps the decay in time. But the idea is as soon as you have good decay in time, you can obtain global in time convergence. Uh, of the form, uh, you know, Fn, Xmt, rho t, now it's going to be less than Cf, um, Xn0, rho 0, without the exponential in time factor plus, you know, something small. Okay. Um, So now I want to show you a little bit what is involved uh, with making this proof. And maybe I will start by saying um, something about the risk case. Ah, yeah, so now before doing that, let me tell you also. Maybe let's, let's do a Vlasov Poisson monokinetic. So I mentioned that uh, we could treat second order equations, but in the case where we make a monokinetic assumption. So uh, let me just state the result for you and you will see it's completely parallel to what I've presented so far. So now we have to look in positions and velocity. Okay, so we're gonna look at the big vector of positions and velocity. Of course, xi dot is vi. And the monokinetic assumption, we look at something like this. So rho t, so let's see, ft equals rho t of x delta in velocity. And so what rho u has to solve is a pressure layer, a layer Poisson. It's a system. Okay. 
Okay, so it's called PEP, so pressureless less protein. And people have proven that this is uh, well posed at least for short time. So there can be a blow up in finite time, but at least for short time also. So what is the modulated energy that you want to define there? So EN of ZN modulated with the limit rho u is defined as one over n sum from one to n u x i minus v i squared plus f n of x n rho. So you see what you're doing here is you have the energy that you had before, the modulated energy. So this is like a potential energy. If you want. And this thing is like a modulated kinetic energy. And you know that in a second order system, you, you should have a potential energy plus a kinetic energy. All right, so this thing is looking at velocity squared, but the difference between the true velocity of the point and the expected velocity at that point, you can take the square. And uh, here it uses very much the monokinetic assumption to make this definition. Okay, so now you do uh, very similar computations, differentiate this in time, and you manage to show uh, a ground value relation again, provided you have a regular enough solution. Okay, so this is the theorem we got. And it's, uh, it was written in the case S, again, S less than D minus, uh, bigger than D minus two, so Coulomb or super Coulomb. And so if you assume that ZNT is a, is a system of uh, positions, velocities that solve uh, Newton's law, the second order system. And rho u is a sufficiently regular solution. So I won't uh, bore you with details of how exactly a regular it needs to be, but similar to before. So these things exist for short time at least. Then uh, you have control of this new uh, modulated energy. And of course the constant depends on uh, the norms of that sufficiently regular solution. Okay, so it's a similar similar. So you remember now, uh, we have to make a proof with this, uh, this true modulated energy, which is this. Integral over the complement of the diagonal. Here we put the empirical measure minus rho t, and let's do tensor twice to say of x of y. Okay, and, and this is what we have to differentiate in time. So let's differentiate in time. Takes a little bit of uh, patience. And of course, when you differentiate, you want to use the equation satisfied by Roti. 
So when you see a dt rho t, you have to input the relation that you know on dt rho t. So you have to use the equation. So I will give you the result of the computation. You have something where you have to take a sort of principal value, where g x minus y. So this thing I call mu and t. Right? So here you get t mu and t minus rho t. And this gets squared. Square t mu and t square. And then you get the second term, which involve grad h rho t of x minus grad h rho t of y dotted with grad g of x minus y t mu and t minus rho t and sure to it. Okay, so you have to compute, you have to insert the equation and you have to do a little bit of regrouping of terms. And here I'm assuming I'm in the gradient flow case. So I get this negative term, you see this dissipative term. If you were not in the, you would have this matrix M, M times this dot this, which would still have a sign. And this computation I claim is this discrete analog of what I was doing here in the continuum case. So if I scroll back up, you see when I was computing this, uh, because formally it's the same, uh, I was obtaining a negative term like this integrated with d mu one and a second term that like that, you see with the quad H2. So now let's think that H2 is, uh, is the potential associated with rho t, the limit. Right, so you see here, this, is, this should be grad H rho T. This should be the empirical measure. And uh, this should be the empirical measure. This should be grad H rho T. And this should be grad of the dis difference of H's. And this is exactly what we have here in this formula. So in fact, uh, uh, I can rewrite it for you in a different way. So. First of all, so let's let's box this. So the first term is good; it has a sign. So we have to worry about the second term. The second term, you can rewrite it by symmetry. So let's. Uh, I'll call this, uh, let me call this V, right? little V like velocity. So you see that you can break it into the integral of V of X dot y G X minus Y D mu and T minus rho T of X D mu and T minus rho T of Y minus the same thing with V of Y. Right? Same thing. Now, change x into y in the second expression, change y into x in the second expression. You see that here, instead of having a y, you can put an x. Here, instead of having x minus y, you can put the y minus x. This is just notation. And here, you have exactly the same things. But now, we can remember that G is even, right? So G of X is G of minus X for all these uh, inverse powers. So I'm using quad G of minus X is minus quad G of X. We get that this is equal to twice the same term. Right? So if you have a minus quad G, 
here you have minus grad G, it's actually the same uh, as X minus Y, it's the same as, sorry, of Y minus X, it's the same as this term. So you have twice the same term, in fact. It's twice C of X dotted grad G. So sometimes it's convenient to write it in symmetrized form like this, V of X minus V of Y. Sometimes it's better to write it in a, in simple form like this. Okay, so let's not forget about our triangle, uh, the diagonal that's been removed. And now I just want to show you that this is the same term that we were looking at before, because now you see you can integrate in Y to see this as a convolution. So I group these two terms and I see that as convolution of G with mu and T minus rho T. I can write this as a single integral T of X dot what H mu and T minus rho T, T mu and T minus rho T. Uh, and this V, if you remember, it's just what H rho T. So now this is exactly of the form that I was showing you before. It had the grad H2, and then it has the grad H1 minus H2, T mu H1 minus H2. So this term actually, we can recognize as the divergence of the stress tensor. T minus root. So it's a little bit formal because of this question of the diagonal, right? This removal of the diagonal. Uh, yeah, it's not completely clear what happens here. Are we supposed to integrate everywhere? But okay, but formally that's that's the idea, at least to recognize it's the same it's the same term. Okay, so now everything is going to rely on a functional analytic. Uh, proposition, which I will state now. I just want to show you before stopping that this is the crucial thing. So because we have a negative term here, now everything boils down to showing that this thing I can control by S itself. So which was the equivalent of, you know, integrating by parts here and controlling this by the end. So we need to show in this uh, discrete context where things have been renormalized by removing the self interaction so this proposition. And now the proposition is really, as I said, functional analysis. It has nothing to do with the PDE. It has nothing to do with the fact that what is a solution. So for every configuration of points, Xn, one Xn, for every probability density, and let's assume it's also in L infinity. Uh, that makes things more easier, but it doesn't have to be a solution to any PDE or anything. And for every V that's a vector field that's Lipschitz. So here you see V is a particular thing, it's related to the solution. But in fact, it's not uh, it's not important for what I'm going to write. Uh, so for all of that, we have integral over Rd cross Rd minus the diagonal of V of X minus V of Y. So this is a Lipschitz, so this goes from Rd to Rd. So Rg X minus Y. Empirical measure, but with any arbitrary points. So this thing is always bounded by a constant times dv times modulated energy plus, as I said, some little additive error, uh, which can be made explicit. Okay. So this proposition is actually crucial 
uh, it's a functional analysis type result. It's proven in my paper with this stress tensor uh, proof, but I, I haven't given you a full proof. And so at first, um, it was proven at first for G, as I said, equals one over X S, S between G minus two and G. Uh, but then it was extended in this paper with uh, Hung and Green and Matt Rosenzweig. Uh, to more general S and more general Gs. So in particular, S less than Z minus two also. More general Gs. Um, of course, you pay a little price, which is that you lose, certainly you lose in the exponents here and you, you may have to assume a little bit more regularity on Z, but that's not so important because you see for the proof, all that matters is that you recover the energy. Okay, so uh, the point of view that we took this is to view, to view this as a commutator estimate. So from now on, I will call this the commutator estimate, even though it's not yet a very transparent why. Uh, and uh, this afternoon or uh, tonight for you, I will explain to you why a commutator estimate and uh, how this has actually unlocked other um, problems uh, because really it's, it's kind of the core of the proof. Okay, so. There are any questions at this point? 